Jewish synagogue architecture and um, some really special Jewish um, art, which we'll be talking, which I will be talking about today. Um, he's a graduate of UC Berkeley's College of Environmental Design and a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. Um, Dr. Fink's family collection includes one of the few surviving sets of Ella Zinsky, a 19th century Russian avant-garde artist, uh, Hadgadia, which is an Aramaic Passover song. Um, and Dr. Fink's presentation will be sort of going into the context and meaning um, behind what this piece truly masterful set. Um, and we're so excited to have you here today, Ira. Without further ado.
another person who had also studied, and um, I think what happened in Vitebis, there was just this great confluence of great art. Um, Abel Penn, the, the famous uh, teacher of Chagall, also taught uh, Lizitsky and Ryback and these others. But there had been an ethnographic expedition through the Pale, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But in 1916, he and Isaac Ryback went to part of the Pale, and he sketched the synagogues. They looked at 200 synagogues and sketched them. He was just an incredible draftsman. He came back, and uh, then 1917 was the Russian Revolution, and he decided that he wanted to improve the, the cultural um, understanding of Judaism. He, he wanted to be a Jewish. In 1917, he started doing what we'll call works of art that had a Jewish theme to them. This went on only for three or so years. I, I can't tell, I have a sense of why he stopped, but when you read his biography that his wife wrote, there's just this line, 1917, 1920, 1917, 1990, Jewish art. And then he goes on with the rest. So he doesn't pay much attention to it, even in his own bibliography. He then moved to Kiev. Illustrations you see here are part of the lithographs of the Hot God Yah, and he did these in 1919, so they'll have their 100th anniversary in two more years. He then uh, moved to Berlin. Uh, a lot of the, the artists left that part. There was a lot of migration out of, out of the area, but he lived in Berlin. He had been sick with tuberculosis, so he went to Switzerland to uh, be in a sanitarium, and then came back, lived in Western Europe, and then in 1928 moved back into Russia and started working on exhibition displays for the Russian government and became an illustrator of Russian and Soviet propaganda. And he died in 1941. So that's sort of the span of his life. Uh, in doing the research for this, I came across the statement from uh, the Simon Weissenthal Center. And I think it sort of sums up what I'm going to present about today. And it's very simply the life that is no more. So he captured and he lived in a time that doesn't exist any longer. And I'm very thankful that he did because uh, it, it's meaningful to me and uh, I think you'll, you'll learn something. I hope you'll learn what I learned. Uh, the story that I want to start begins with the Pale of Settlement. And this was uh, created by Catherine the Great in uh, 1791. A large swath of land, I'll show you a map in a moment. Uh, it extended from the Black Sea on sort of the south to the Baltic on the north. It was the home of five million Jews by uh, 1897. And uh, Jews were uh, forced to live in this area. There was a little bit of Judaism, Jewish people who could leave and live in other cities, Moscow, if you were an artisan, if you were a physician, if you had certain kinds of skills. But the rest of the population of, of Russia who was Jewish lived in the Pale. Uh, it was not a good life. Uh, it's, it said that maybe a third of the population was in poverty. Uh, there were massive migrations out. There were programs, the different czars, each had different laws, the May laws, all kinds of things that affected this Jewish population that lived there. And then there was the Russian Revolution in 1905 that was not successful. There was two Russian revolutions in 1917, and the first one in the early part of the year, Tsar Nicholas II abdicated, he was later assassinated, and then the Bolsheviks took over in the fall of that year. So that's sort of what the Pale of Settlement, that's where the Jewish population lived, and it's really key to this story. So this is the Pale, circle 1900. So this is, and I'm going to take the pipe off. So this is Vitebsk, where Lizitsky lived. This is where his grandfather lived and where he went to school. This is Mogilev, where he went with Isaac Ryback to draw synagogues and uh, be in the pale. It also said that he might have come down to these areas down here, which is Wahalnia and Podilia. This is the Black Sea. Uh, this is Odessa. This is where my father was born. This is uh, the Baltic, and my mother was born here in Rodno. Uh, this area, it's hard to grasp how large it is. Uh, this is what it looks like today in the 
the same series of countries. It makes up the Ukraine, Belarus, uh, part of Lithuania, part of Poland. If you're from the East Coast, the size of this pale is the equivalent to all of the U.S. states that border the Atlantic. So if you start in Maine, and you go Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, New York, Pennsylvania, Delaware, the Virginias, the Carolinas, Georgia, and Florida, that's the equivalent size of the Pale of Settlement. And if you're from the West, like I am, it's equivalent to Nevada, California, and Arizona. So this is a very large piece of land. And if you look, capture uh, the history of the folklore of the pale. And he was able to get some large grants from a couple of Jewish uh, philanthropists. And he set out expeditions in 1911, 1912, 13, and 14 to go and collect objects in, from the pale. And these would include, uh, I think it was his nephew Solomon Udeman, anyway, uh, an artist named Solomon Udeman, who was a photographer, and they took 2,000 photographs. I got 1,800 pieces of objects like you see displayed here in, in the Magnus. Uh, they collected music. They collected all the folk literature. They had, he was a great researcher, they had a 2,000 question questionnaire that they wanted to uh, uh, have. And then with the war and everything, they thought that all of these pieces that, that uh, Anski had put together were lost because he wanted to create an ethnographic museum they're now finding them. They've been stored in different museums. But he, he, I think, brought to life what the life was like, and he was trying to preserve it. So this is the pale as it existed around 1900. Again, uh, this is where Zizkowski's from, his grandfather. This is where my mother's from. This is where my dad is from. So uh, it's a very, very large piece of land. And I keep thinking I have a different map, but I'm going to go back What I didn't know about the pale was how, how it came to be. So in the late 1700s, Poland went through three partitionings. And in the partitionings, they took, they took this part of, of, the, of what was Poland and gave it to Prussia. So this became later Germany and the German states. They took this part, which is Galicia and uh, all the countries that today make up Czechoslovakia and Romania was alone, but this is Hungary and Austria, and this was the second part of the partition. And then this was the third part of the partition, the pale. And it made sense to me now to understand why the lives of people who lived in Prussia, who lived in Germany, were quite different than the lives of the Jews who lived and I never knew that. I never knew that just because I didn't know. Everybody else probably knows, but Poland had been that way. And then with the wars and succession, Poland got to be a formal country. And certain parts of these populations were uh, wanted. So Poland wanted people. They, it was a large agriculture area. But the Russians just put up with the pale. Uh, this is probably what life looked like for a lot of the people who lived in the Pale. This is a shtetl. Uh, I counted 16 kids here under probably age 10 or 12. Uh, the Jewish families were very large. My, my mother was one of eight, my dad one of six. Uh, and even though somewhere between two and two and a half million Jews left that area in between 1890 and, and 1914, the population never changed 
because the Jewish families were so large, they just replenished themselves. Um, and as I mentioned, on the first expeditions, there was this wonderful man, Solomon Yudavan, who was um, not only a photographer, but he, he took sketches and made sketches of tombstones. And he has a wonderful book about uh, his art called Jewish Folk Art. And in the tombstones, this is one of them, but this is another piece of his art. And I don't know its time frame. And I don't know where it came from, I took it off the web, but it starts to illustrate some of the symbols that start to show up in the art of this time. So if you see the eye, and this is the eye of God, you see, I don't know the, the meaning of the face in the window, it has to have some meaning. This is a candle that's associated, I don't think it's a yardside candle necessarily, but a candle with death, and the flame of the candle is the soul, the soul going to heaven. This is the funeral procession, and you see there's no adornment. The body is just wrapped in a shroud. Here, the Yudavan has a tombstone, and on it he has some engravings that look like uh, what he had drawn. And then on this tombstone here are the Hebrew letters uh, Pe Nun, and it stands for Here Lies. So these are just some of the symbols that he captured. This was drawn after the Lutzinski piece, but you'll see this repeated. And then last week, just a week ago today, in the New York Times, there was an article about the discovery of a Jewish cemetery reburial area in Rome from either the 1350s to the 1650s, and they said there were two signs that they knew made it a Jewish cemetery. One, that the graves were unadorned. There were no ornaments with the graves. But in addition, there's this little statement said, nearby writing in Hebrew that said, here lies. So, Pei is an expression, uh, something that has been through the centuries. Uh, Isaac Ryback, uh, also just an incredible artist, um, went with Luzitsky to the Pale. Uh, he started to do his own kinds of drawings. These are charcoal drawings. I, I think they're just absolutely incredible. And he made caricatures of what he saw. So this is a synagogue that, that Ryback drew, uh, and this is from 1923. But Ryback, like Lutzitsky in the 1917, 1920s, was an illustrator of children's books. So this is one, the cover of one of his books called Eugen Birds. But the bird here is a special bird. This is a peacock. And the peacock in the liturgy has a very special meaning because as you know, the peacock drags its feathers behind it. And so the peacock was a symbol of the Jewish nation, and its past was behind it, but being a proud bird, it was looking, uh, looking forward and making sounds and said, you know, we are surviving, this is behind us, and this is where we're moving forward. Lizitsky, in his first piece of Jewish art, uh, this is called, has various names, Small Talk Legends of Prague, that's the English transliteration, um, did this and he did a piece of it and put it in, colored it and put it in a, in a, a scroll like a Megillah. Uh, but in this piece, this is the very first piece, this is his first piece of Jewish art in 1917, but he also uses a peacock to hold a Hasidic man. And there's a big story behind this, but it'll take me all day to tell you the story of this. Um, one other author said, that looks like a giant rooster, so I don't know. I think for every explanation, there's always two other explanations. So I think it's a peacock that makes the story better. Uh, Lizitsky, uh, his name was actually uh, Lazar Marovich Lizitsky. He didn't change it to El Lizitsky until he was through the Jewish period. So you don't see El Lizitsky associated with his Jewish works of art. It's always signed Elazar Markovich Lizitsky. And this is a copy he made of a wall painting on the Mulligan Synagogue. He was just, so now he is, this is 1916, so he's 16 and 19, he's 25 years old. I mean, this is just incredible artwork. And then he, he did all kinds of drawings. This one is one of my favorites. This is uh, of a lion, and every time I look at this, it makes me think of Bert Lair from uh, The Wizard of Oz when he's in that <coughs> lion costume. Uh, he also wrote about his experiences. It was eight years later, and uh, there was a 
two publications simultaneously in Hebrew and in, and in Yiddish. And he wrote his reminiscences. And they're wonderful to read because it, it talks about how he felt when he walked into the synagogue. And in one place, he makes a statement, the artist's treasure trove of formal invention is inexhaustible. One can see how everything flows as from a horn of plenty and how the hand of the virtuoso never flags but maintains a steady pace of creativity. So he's talking about the wall paintings. He talks about being behind the bema and seeing where the paintings began. I mean, he's just so smart about seeing this and understanding it. And his, this is a transliteration of his poetry to me. In his children's books, this is one of the first. This is like Tom Thumb. This is the story of a, a small boy. Again, I won't go through the whole story. But he starts to illustrate the shtetls uh, on the inside cover page. He starts something that he uses later on, a lot of calligraphy using the Hebrew letters and the diagonals, which uh, if you've seen things on a diagonal, they always have a force connected with them. But he, he becomes a graphicist, and this is still in 1917 in his formative years of doing this. This is one of his sketches. And in this sketch, uh, this man has got a talus on, and he's spanning a river. And his right foot is in the Jewish side, so this is the synagogue side. But his left foot is in the Slavic side. And so this is, you can see the, the cross. Uh, and the foundations for his feet are the narrative. And so he's learning how to integrate art into a narrative text. So this is one of the things that makes his, his work so wonderful. He uses page numbers in very, this is page number one. And he flips the, the Slavic and the Jewish side. So this is the goat on the Slavic side and the pig representing the Slavs on the Jewish side. <clears throat> Haggadah. Where does Haggadah come from? Well, Haggadah is part of the Haggadah. The Haggadah gets its start with Exodus where it's, God says, and you shall tell your sons the story of our Exodus from Egypt. But as a formal document, as a written document, is something that you see on, at, at Passover that didn't begin until roughly 2,000 years ago. So in the Haggadah, this is the one that we use in our house, it's in English. Uh, if you go towards the back of it, you find this series of verses called Haggadah. And they were added, everyone thinks, in 1590. They came from German liturgy. And they believe it's a story that was put in to keep children awake. Uh, I know in the early years of my family, a Seder could last six or seven hours at end by midnight, but this was part of the piece to keep children awake. And it's a series of 10 verses. So I printed it out, it's sitting back there if you want to read along. I'm not going to read each verse now, but these are the verses, and it's, it's sung as a round. So you read one verse, then you read the next verse with the second line, being repeated in the third line, and you go all the way through all ten of the verses. Um, so my summary of it, for the research I was doing, I just called it goat, cat, dog, all the way down to the holy one. But there's also all kinds of interpretations of what do all of these symbols mean. So the goat was meant to be the Jewish people, the oppressed Jewish people. And then all of the other figurines in the Haggadah, Haggadah are the nation states that were uh, oppressors of Jews, who conquered Jews, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, etc., until the end of the Haggadah when God appears again and is messianic redemption. So that's the, the symbolism that begins. But there are other interpretations that, as I said, every kind of thing has two or three interpretations. But this is one interpretation that these were the oppressors of the when Lodzitsky started to illustrate the Haggadah, uh, the Haggadah, he did so first in watercolor. And in this one, and I think what's important is that the Haggadah are just verses, they're just words. There's no illustration that tells you how to illustrate Haggadah. So this is his own imagination of how I'm going to portray this song, the, the, these lyrics. And he did it. First, by forming this arch, which is sort of an architectural form. He, because he studied architecture, he could see things in three dimensions, so that was important to him. Uh, here's the goat. Here's the father leading the goat, so that 
one thing, you know, I'm buying this goat for two zuzim. He writes in Hebrew the story, and in Aramaic the story, uh, and then here's the water colors in the shuttle. So this, and then this is the page number, all of it. So this now, uh, and I borrowed all of these drawings from the web. So it, these are just illustrations, but this was in the state Tretyakov Museum in Moscow. Uh, the next year he did another series. These are opaque watercolors, and now he's starting to change it a little bit. He's starting to fill in the arch, the same lettering that goes on. But now he started to add things. So here is a boy with the goat, the father, and he has the rainbow. And so the rainbow is also a symbol. And the, the rainbow is from uh, Genesis, where God is talking to Noah, and he says that I'm not going to destroy the earth, and as a symbol of my covenant, I'm going to create, even though the rainbow existed, I'm going to create the rainbow. So the rainbow was part of this covenant between God and the Jewish people. And it shows up now in this illustration for what he wants to do in the Hod God Yah. And then again, the shells. And then he does the lithographs. So those are one of a kind. This is one of 75 sets of the lithographs that he made in 1919. And originally, it's a series of 11 plates. And it has this trifold cover that wasn't discovered until 1982. Uh, these are, I think, maybe because the quality of the paper, whatever, very fragile. And John Wolf, who's at the University of Southern California, wrote about this. But this also has all kinds of symbolism in it. So on the left-hand side are the 10 verses of the Hot God Yah. And it's a little hard to see, but he's linked verse 1 to verse 2, verse 2 to verse 3. But by the time he gets to the end, verse 10, He's made it into a circle. They, they've all come together. Here, he uses the uh, yud yud as a symbol, also an expression for God. He signs his name over here, and he's looking at sort of the cubist way of, of diagramming and illustrating. So cubism was coming in favor. I'm sure all of these artists knew what others were doing. This is the cover page. And it, I, don't have, I didn't bring it, but I brought the first page. And now you start to see what he's changed and what he's starting to illustrate in the lithograph. So here's the rainbow. Here's some of the scholars that said these pairs of eyes, the eyes on the sun and the eyes on the goat, make up one pair of eyes because they're both similarly shaped. Here in Aramaic or Hebrew, it says, you know, I have done this work. And here's his name, Eliazar Zitsky. The son is holding a book, and the title on the book is Hot God Yah. This is a verse number one, uh, one small goat, half a block for two zuzi. And now he starts to do all kinds of other things with the art. If you can see, the father figure is in green, and the name for father is also in green. So he takes this arch with the Hebrew letters and makes a piece of the lettering the same as the main figure of the drawing. Uh, here are more shuttles. It's hard to see, this is a figurine of a cat who shows up in the next verse. And here's the goat, and here's the boy. Uh, and I think that's about all. But he fills out the entire frame. And here, oh yeah, here's the page number, page number one. And if you look at it larger, he has a figurine of a goat. So olive and the goat. The Zuzim is a coin from about the time of the second temple. Its value was a quarter of a shekel. And so the saying is, the father bought the goat for two zuzim. Mm -hmm. So two zuzim would equal a half a shekel. And at that time, there was a half a shekel tax on all adult Jewish males at age 20 who were counted as part of the census. They had to provide a half a shekel tax to keep for the upkeep of the temple. And one of the commentators said, equivalency is a half a shekel for a man's soul. And so there's another expression that comes out of I bought the goat for two zuzi. Uh, in verse number two, uh, the cat comes and eats the goat. And if you see these, even though the story is horrific, these are a little bit cheerful illustrations. I'm going to show you another set that's not quite as cheerful. Uh, so here we start to see more imagery. We see the eye of God. Uh, we see the goat. We see the lettering. 
we see, I think one of these has somebody taking water out of the well. But the page number here is also all face. And here's a figure. I thought it was a dog. The others think it's a cat. So he's using all of these ways of illustrating. Verse number three, a dog came and bit the cat. And now there's more anger in the illustrations, the, the sawtooth figurines, uh, the shtetl drawings. Uh, again, the color of the, of the dog and his name in the literature up at the top is the same. In verse number four, then came a stick and beat the dog. And for the stick, he uses part of the fulcrum for taking water out of a well. And so this is the stick that is beating the stock. It's a piece of the fork that he used to pump or get water out of the well. Uh, again, drawings of the shtetl, uh, a man running away. I guess he can foretell the danger that's ahead. And uh, now he stops using that. The rainbow has gone from these drawings, so the rainbow is no longer in the sky. In verse number five, then came a fire and burnt the stick. So again, these are his interpretations of how do I translate these verses into art. So in this case, he chose to use a rooster. Uh, well, it's also a red rooster. And in the folklore of the country at that time, a red rooster stood for arson. That was the synonym for arson. So he's using the red rooster to portray fire, but also arson because now the synagogues, using sort of the Ryback illustrations of the synagogues, are on fire. So he's, he's showing to the world that the, the shtetls and the Jews living in, in the pale are subject to fires and the section of the synagogues. And he does it through uh, the rooster, the red rooster. In uh, verse 6, then water came and quenched the fire. and this is a large fish. I think this illustration is over here too. There's some interpretation that because these wall paintings on the, in the synagogue are also zodiac paintings, that maybe this is Leviathan, the large fish. You know, that, that could be one interpretation. Uh, I didn't know that probably there is one person who took water out of the well. Maybe everybody didn't go to the well, and the man is now taking water and leaving. They wonder why he wasn't putting out the fire. But this is. Lizitsky's interpretation that this large mythological, mythological fish is spraying the water on the fire. In verse 7, then came an ox and drank the water. And this looks like a very friendly ox. Uh, uh, I think there's not so many symbols in here. Again, the shtetl, the red for the ox, and the red and the lettering up here. In verse number 8, and then the butcher came and slew the ox. But this is no ordinary butcher for Kulitsitsky. This is a ritual butcher. So this butcher is dressed in the ritual garb. He has the kind of knife that's used for uh, kosher's killing of animals. Um, Francesco, who is not here today, told me that in the Magnus collection, they have, do you have how many of these do you have, Zoe? Several dozen. Several dozen, OK. So they have several dozen of these ritual knives that are used. Um, and he, you know, the eyes of the, of the ox and the eyes of the shocket look very similar. Um, and the, then the uh, butcher slays the ox. And in verse number nine, the angel of death comes and kills the butcher. So now we see the butcher who's been killed by the angel of death. Here's a candle at his head. Again, the soul going to the heavens, uh, the head of the, of the uh, ox. But in the doorway here is the angel of death. So Lenzitsky has chosen to portray the angel of death as the czar. And he has on the angel of death the kind of hat that the czars in Russia would wear. Sometimes it's tri-figure, sometimes it's just a round crown. But he's saying, you know, the angel of death was the czar. And in the final verse, I'm sorry, this is what some of the, the crowns of the czars might have looked like uh, over that time. And then in the final verse, and that's also illustrated over here, and the Holy One, blessed be he, came and killed the angel of death. So now we see a lot of symbols. We see the eye of God. We see 
see the sword, the power. We see the shofar. We see the rainbow return. So this is redemption. We see the shahid and the goat who have both been killed, rising, being arisen. We see the angel of death on the ground with his um, czar's hat. We see pei nun, here lies. And there's other people can't interpret what these things are. And then Lozitsky changes his name now to E.L. L. Lozitsky. So in Yiddish, uh, people were introduced by the initials of their first two names along with their last name. So this, this are his initials, first, first two names. So that takes us through his Hakkadah. And then the, if you saw this sword, so this is 1919, but in 1918 through 1925, Russian postage, the 35 kopeck and 70 kopeck stamps, had this sword, and they're breaking the chains of bondage from the czars. This is a very strong symbol that he's using as well. So that was a happy hot gadya. This is a second hot gadya that I want to show you, and this is by uh, Menachem Birnbaum. Menachem Birnbaum was in Austria, so he lived in a different part of the partition of, of Poland. Austria-Hungary during the First World War, where he would have been living, lost 1.1 million soldiers and 500,000 other Austrians. So his view of the First World War is different. He's not celebrating the uh, downfall of the Tsar, the Russian Revolution. So his view of the Haggadah is quite different and quite violent. So, in, and I only have a few of these to show. So here is the father holding the, the goat and the child you know, just yearning to get the goat so there's tension and anxiety. Here, skipping along, this is the dog biting the cat. But this dog is not just biting the cat, he's slinging the cat. And the, the cat's blood is all around and you can see the anger on, on the dog. Here, the stick is beating the dog, but this is not an ordinary stick, this is a crutching from the heavens, crushing the dog and the pool of blood below. So Birnbaum had a whole different interpretation of Hat Gad <laughs> Same verses, but these are his expressions of it. He died in the Holocaust, his brother wrote the text for it, uh, and then this is the, the butcher that came and slew the ox. So this is not a ritual slaying, this is a, a, a ferocious slaying of the ox. And then in the verse, and then came death and took the butcher. We don't see death. We only see death's hands, these two little palms hiding the eyes of the butcher who is being slain. So this is a violent expression of hot god yah. Um, then this is the American artist Frank Stella. I don't know if any of you had the opportunity to see his exhibition with the young. You know, you saw his wonderful art. But he also did a uh, series of hot god yah drawings. You saw the Lazitsky piece of the 70s. He had done a piece on wooden synagogues. And this was his tribute. He's not Jewish. And so he's now illustrating uh, the Haggad Yah. And it took him two or three years. And these are very large pieces of graphics. These are two feet square. But his interpretation is quite abstract. So this is the cover. This is the father buying the goat for two zuzim. Uh, this is the dog biting the cat. This is the stick beating the dog. The butcher slaying the ox, and then death came and took the butcher. So a very different interpretation of Hot God Yah from uh, the American artist Frank Stella. Uh, so after Lozitsky finished this period of his life from 1917 to roughly 1920, he then went into more graphic kinds of things. A very famous book is called About Two Squares. And when you read this book, it's you read it out loud. It's a children's book, and it's in Russian. But the Tate Museum in London just last year put out a wonderful uh, copy of this where they have both the Russian and the translation in English. So now I can read it and understand what the story is. So it says, you know, to all children, and then this says uh, about two squares. But I, don't, I didn't bring all of the pieces to it. He also became a book illustrator uh, for book covers. He, he was the founder of modern typography where he takes letters all the 
photograph the kinds of symbols, all the kinds that he learned as an architect, triangles and circles and things. So this is his cover for the first uh, Russian art exhibition in Berlin in 1922. This is a drawing of his also from about the same year, um, where he's illustrating a book by uh, Ilya Ehrenberg. And this is one of the verses in the book. It's about six stories with easy endings. And this one is called Boat Ticket. And I brought this along because he, he has the Jewish star still in here. You can see the six-pointed star. He has uh, the, the boat schedule, the, the schedule for travel from Europe to the United States. And then he has this palm print. And again, in the middle of the palm print, there's pay no, here lies. So I think he's telling the story of the people who are leaving this terrible land to go to a better land and go to the U.S. Then he moves on, and when I showed this once to uh, Zoe, she said, this is all she knew about Lodzinski. She never knew about this other part of it, because his most famous part is when he gets into um, constructivism, and this is, uh, this is actually the cover of a book by his wife, but this is called New Man. So, in summary, he, he's this bigger-than-life figure to me. Uh, he was very independent. He, he, he lived all of the causes that, that he participated in. Uh, this is from the exhibition catalog at, at the Harvard Museum from 1987. And um, Peter Nesbitt said he considered him to be an architecture student. Everybody looks at his life differently. So a lot of the people don't see the Jewish part of him. They see all these other parts of him. He participated in the revival of Jewish culture. That's what he wanted to do, but it was a very short period of his life. He converted to geometric abstraction. He became this bridge between the Soviets and the West, he used to travel. He'd do exhibitions. The 1937 World's Fair, the Russian exhibition was by Lodzinski, or a piece of it was by Lodzinski. He was a great author. He was the founder of modern typography. There, you see what he's done. The, Museum of Modern Art constantly has exhibitions of Russian books, and you see what he's done, and, and they're just fantastic. And then he became a propagandist for the Soviets. So with that, I'm going to stop. I think we have some time, and be happy as best I can to uh, respond to your questions. And then, if there are no questions, I'll show you the coverage of some of the, the works that I use to do this. So thank you.